Good afternoon. Welcome to the weekly edition of The Wrap. I'm Laura Leslie, WRL Capital Bureau Chief. And I'm Travis Sane, one of WRL's state government reporters. And we are off and running. we got bills filed um, coming in this week and um, starting to hear some bills, actually, our first committee hearings. Yeah, did, did this is going to sound ridiculous to people who know that I do this for a living and have for 20 years. <laughs> Did the session catch you off guard at all? Like it, it like they really started now. Well, it, no. Okay, it's no. just me. I was like, oh, they're like like bills and stuff, huh? Well, you know, committee I, meetings. I think part of it too is that in the last couple of years they've been kind of you know with COVID and then with um you know they've been kind of tr- dialing things back a little bit, right? You know, and um and now it's sort of full throttle. Right you know? now we're at the beginning of a a long session. And they're kind of eager to get going, it seems like. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think it seems to me that what they've set for a crossover date this year is later than usual. Mm. So that means we may have more time to hear more bills before we get to crossover. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, great stuff. So um, so we should actually, let's mention some of the bills that we've been looking at. Uh, the first bill out of the gate in the Senate was the... Um, the um, Parents' Bill of Rights Bill. Yeah. Um, and that or the, one, fir- the first kind of big one, the first one that we're all paying attention to. Yeah. Um, and so that was the first one to get a committee hearing. And um, it will be on the floor, it looks like, probably Tuesday night for a vote. We have written about this ad nauseum online. So we have plenty of information about the bill. But suffice it to say that there was something similar last year that did pass the Senate. The House didn't take it up in part because they expected a veto from Governor uh, Cooper. However, um, this year they're closer. They just need somebody to be absent, really, a Democrat or two, to be absent, to be able to override a veto. So they are hoping that this time the House will take it up, uh, move forward with it. Uh, just to sum up briefly what it would do, it would um, sort of banish sexuality, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, that kind of uh, information from instructional materials or classroom materials for K through 4. Um, and it would also, much more controversially, uh, require the school to notify parents uh, if a child has asked, a student has asked to use different pronouns or a different name, um, which is problematic, uh, many people say, including uh, people who are mental health professionals. Right. And I mean, you can see it, right? Like, I, I, I'm a kid. I am questioning, you know, what I am, what my life is. And, and I confide in a teacher. I'm not ready to tell my parents for whatever reason. But if I say, hey, I want to actually go by some different pronouns, Bam, that triggers it. They're supposed to tell your parents uh, out you, essentially. It, it, yeah. I think that's a fair way to look at it. And it, this is kind of, of course, triggering more conversation that we've had in this country over the last few years about schools and their responsibilities versus parents and their responsibilities. And, you know, I've seen some some back and forth on Twitter about, well, you know, parents are are much more important. And I don't think that's really at issue. People are arguing that. But, I mean, you got you got to think – that kid is deciding not to tell their parent for a reason, and I don't know what that reason is. So, I mean, you're— A lot of times they're just not ready. Right. You know? I mean, a lot of trans kids, they do what's called social transitioning at school before they are at home, kind of helping to figure out what they— how they feel about this, you know, do they feel supported, can they, you know, what they can say— I mean, it's a very difficult situation to be in, for sure. And, um, you know, and I do understand that there are parents who, you know, that have concerns, real concerns, that the schools are not giving them enough information when their kids are having issues or troubles, including this. Um, you know, so and that seems to be a real issue that people are concerned about. So um, we'll just have to see where this lands, I guess. But I have no reason to think that it's going to be significantly different by the time it gets through the House. Yeah, no, I mean, when it's the same bill, basically, that they had last year, you, you would expect this one to move. Less likely to move, I think, is the one kind of the, the medical side of this, blocking puberty blockers and any other type of medical treatment, I think, including surgery, mm-hmm. you know, for, for kids who are eight, under 18. Right. Um, that's like it's like a George Cleveland bill. It's yeah. it, it's got support from the, the you know, the far right of, of the House. We would be, I believe, one of the first states in the country. I think Utah just just recently. There are about five or six that have done this. So, so, so we would be in the vanguard, so to speak, on this issue. I don't know. That I'm I'm sensing that uh, I, I don't know that that's going to be a mover, uh, but it is kind of along the same lines in the same area as this other bill we're talking about. And then, you know, last year there was a bill or there was a, there was talk of you know trans athletes. Yeah, and I'm whether waiting not, on that bill, wh- whether or not the legislature needed to get involved and say, now if you were born and you assigned this sex at birth, then you can't compete in in women's basketball. <coughs> It'll be interesting to see if that comes up this year. That was something that leadership talked about a little bit and just decided, nah, we're not, we're not, we're not going to get into that. They, they, 
you start to get, I think, more national attention. Yeah. When you start digging in on that issue. And I don't know if, if, if we want that here or not. Yeah. Although I will also say, I mean, I don't know to what extent some of that um, reticence on the part of some of the GOP leaders was driven by um, the belief that things were going to get vetoed anyway. Right. Right. So I, I don't get that argument. It's okay. not like it had stopped them in the past. You know, they, mm-hmm. they, it's not like, I mean, what has Cooper vetoed? Something like 70 bills? A lot. I mean, yeah. that the, all of a sudden, well, we don't want to we don't want to do something the governor is going to veto. What a waste of time that would be. If there's <laughs> one thing the North Carolina legislature never does, Laura, it's, it's waste, waste time. time. Right. Uh, and some of these um, some other bills that the governor has vetoed are also um, been filed again this year. Uh, one of them has to do with the um, the independence uh, boards to run the schools for the deaf and blind. That was vetoed last year or last session, I should say, um, allowing um, guns in, in schools that are churches on the weekends. That's been filed again. Um, making The pistol uh, permit, repealing pistol permit yep, programs. That's been filed again. Um, the bill um, to make it easier for hotels to throw out people who are living in them, that's also was vetoed. That's also back again. There's a House and a Senate version. Uh, John yep. Bradford in the House and uh, I believe Vicki Sawyer in the Senate filed that bill. And then we saw some different bills filed this this uh, this week. I should mention one of interest. Um it would make it um, a bill that would make it a felony, um, a class C felony. So you're going to jail kind of felony um, for uh, attacking um, a substation, an electric substation or or broadband. Um, and so this is in response, of course, to the Moore County attacks. Well, now there have been other attacks, too. Jones right. County, People taking shots or, or they're what? You know, mm-hmm. at, at, at power substations and basically collapsing that part of the power grid temporarily. Right. So they could get up to around, I think it was around 10 years in prison and up to like a quarter million dollar fine. Yeah. And this is one that you have to think is going to to have bipartisan support. and It's going to move forward. Uh, there, There's just kind of this quirk in the law. Like a, right now, I think you could probably, number one, if you get caught doing this, you're going to get federal charges. Mm. You, you are going to be in lots of trouble. Number two, you could be charged with terrorism on the state level. But I, I'm not sure if that language perfectly fits what we're seeing here. So the idea is here is let's just be sure. Let's close this loophole. Let's make sure that everyone knows that if you get caught doing this, it is going to be very, very bad for the rest of uh, your, 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 you're going to have a rough decade. Yeah. We also saw a bill to require high schools to, uh, to is it high school sports only? It, it, it's high school sports to, or it might be all events. I'm not sure. But I mean, the bottom line is if you're a school and you're having an event and you charge admission, you got to take cash. You can't force people to pay uh, online with a card. Or a, apparently, what what has happened at some events is, you go to see your kid play basketball, and they're like, "Well, you have to download an app to get the ticket to go." And you're thinking, "Come on, I mean, <laughs> I got to download an app to go see my kid play high school basketball." Really? Come on. So this and this is similar to a, a bill that I believe we talked about last week from Brendan Jones where it would require businesses to take cash at all times, uh, retail businesses that mm-hmm. you walk into. So I, this is some of the backlash against the technology that we have, that, that society has decided to kind of foist upon us all um, and, and, and force you to do things a little bit different way than maybe some people want to. Uh, ben Moss filed a bill that um, is <clears throat> novel, as far as I can tell. Um, that is the bill that would require um, businesses or that basically – if they can charge you money for canceling or being late to an appointment, then they have to pay you if they cancel or are late to an appointment. And so this would cover service providers of all kinds. It's it's not really specified in the bill. I mean, it looks to me like it would apply to doctors, hair salons. Yeah, and we've yeah. all sat somewhere thinking about this, right? Thinking, so I let me get this straight. If I don't give you 24 hours, I'm paying you, what, 250 bucks, whatever it is you're paying for, for a missed appointment. But I can just sit here for an hour waiting, waiting yeah. for you to, to come talk to me. So I, this is one that has got to be a talker, right? Uh, yeah, it is a talker. And I, I think a lot of people would love to see this. But, of course, the business community is not among that group. Right. Uh, so I really can't see this probably going too far. Ben Moss has been filing some interesting bills, though. He's running for uh, labor commissioner. Yep. He, he is doing a very good job of upping his profile with the way he is uh, sponsoring bills. I think that's absolutely true. Um, some other bills that we've seen before, the Speaker's Riot Bill is yeah. back up. That one yeah. got vetoed, I think. It um, makes rioting a felony. I just, I, I always, when we talk about the line between a felony and a misdemeanor, and this is not to say, well, felony, sh- uh, rioting should be this or it should be that. Most of your domestic violence charges, not a felony. 
most of them are misdemeanors. DWI, I think that's not a felony until your third or fourth one. So I, I think people have this idea in their minds that a felony is not as serious as a felony is. A felony is a real big deal. You lose your voting rights for a, a right. period of time. You lose the right to, uh, to own a gun for a period of time. You typically serve time in prison. Uh, so Typically, yeah. Just, just I will throw that out there. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and so that one, that one I wanted to mention in particular, and the literacy test bill. So this is a bill that's been filed just about every session since about 1969. Uh, it is a bill that would re- repeal the section of the uh, North Carolina Constitution that requires a person who c- being registered to vote, they have to demonstrate that they can read and write the Constitution. Yeah, and they, obviously we don't enforce this because it is blatantly racist and unconstitutional. It was only, it was only enforced against black voters, right? It's right. Jim Crow law. So, um, so the thing is, they tried to they tried to get rid of it in 1970, and in 1970, the voters refused to repeal it. Now, you got to remember that was the middle of the civil rights era. There's a lot of tension. You know, I don't know exactly what happened there, but it was a huge sort of national black eye for North Carolina. And so since then, lawmakers uh, of both parties have been hesitant to put it back on the ballot, just leave it, leave sleeping dogs lie, as some people would say. Um, but the, you know, but legislators, especially uh, African-American legislators, have been pushing hard to get this out of the Constitution because it's just it's blatantly unconstitutional. The U.S. Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. So they're going to try it again if they can get this bill through. Um, and this year, uh, Senate Leader Berger has said that he is supportive. And the last couple of times it's gotten through the House, uh, it failed to get through the Senate. So, Surely it'll move this year. And surely when it goes on the ballot in 2024, November 2024, voters in North Carolina will vote to remove this. Although I do suspect we will see a number uh, – it will not pass with 100 percent of the no. vote. And it'll be a sad – commentary when, well, when that happens. I talked to one of the sponsors today, Terry Brown from uh, Mecklenburg County. He said, you know, the last thing anybody wants is for it, it to fail again. But, right. they, you know, they're, but they're going to try to word it very carefully. So it's very clear what it does and what it doesn't do, you know, um, and um, and do some, you know, some public outreach so that people understand what this is. Because, I mean, I wonder to what extent people in 1970 just really had no idea why this mattered. Maybe, yeah. Or what, or what it was about, you know. Or, or, and I mean, I guess you could have an argument, well, if you can't read and write, should you vote? And, you know, without yeah. thinking too deeply about the history of it. But I'm not going to give a lot of benefit of the doubt on this one. Yeah. So we'll, we will, we will see how that one t- turns out. Yeah. I'll tick through a couple of other bills. Uh, HB 47, this is to allow armed security guards in schools. That's an idea that comes up every, every year or two. Kayla's Law, I don't have a bill number on this, but it would allow more remote testimony in domestic violence cases where if the victim feels like this is going to be traumatizing for me to have to stand here in this courtroom and, and, and testify uh, to, to allow more of it to be remote. H43, that's a school schedule bill for Alamance County. Now we see these almost, well, we do every session where they want to start earlier than the, I can't remember what the date is in law. It's sometime in August that you can't start before, right? Right. All right. So it, it, nothing kind of particular about that. We see local bills where this school system or that school system wants to start early, except this one right in the title is about addressing pandemic learning loss. So I'm just flagging that you're going to see school calendar bills that are going to be pitched as, well, we need time to make up for pandemic learning loss. So exempt us from this schedule in law. There's a new way, a new way around the barn, I think. I wonder how many counties actually abide by the, the deadlines. I don't know. It's a good I question. mean, it just seems like every year there's just, just you know, scads and scads of counties asking for exceptions. So, um, a couple of things I wanted to mention. Well, to go back for a second, felons voting. So you covered a hearing on this is the first um, oral argument I think the Supreme Court has held since it um, flipped over to um, Republican uh, control. Th- this week was this was this week. Uh, there were a number of lawsuits. This is the first one that we we've, we've written about, I believe. Okay. So what what was that one about? So okay, right now. If you are convicted of a felony, you lose your voting rights while you're in prison. You get them back after your sentence. But, you know, let's talk about the definition of your sentence. Uh, right now, you have to finish probation you have to, or parole. You have to pay your court fines and fees, restitution, all that. It has to be totally done. Then you get your voting rights back automatically. And what this lawsuit that was filed argues is that, no, the line should be moved up. It should be as soon as you get out of prison. Even though you haven't paid fines and fees, if you haven't, if you're still on parole, whatever, still on probation, you should you should be able to vote then. 
about 56,000 people would become eligible to vote. And this lawsuit allowed them to vote in the 2022 elections. But, I mean, y'all know how these lawsuits, they take forever to work through the courts. So lower court says this, an election happens, so you have these rules during that election, but the Supreme Court has had not, the, not had the final word. Now we're going to have the final word on this, and it was before the state Supreme Court on Thursday. And, yeah, I, it sounded very much like the Republican majority – uh, the five-two Republican majority on the state Supreme Court, they they really were not having it. You know, they, they it sounds like this is going to go down and not not be a successful suit at the Supreme Court level because based on the questions that were asked, pointed questions that were being asked, right. Um, and some other big news this week, um, we got a, a report on the, the state of teaching in, in state of the teaching profession in North Carolina. Now you covered this, right? Uh, Emily Walkenhorst covered this okay. for us, but it, I, I found it disconcerting. It, it's not huge numbers, but so the public school systems every at the 40th day of every year they figure out how many teaching jobs are vacant, and it was a 58.4 percent increase in vacant teaching positions this fall compared to the previous year. It's more than 5,000 positions now. I'm going to get into some context on that number in a second. But here's the part that worried me. At the same time, so vacancies are up in our public school classrooms. At the same time, the state has fewer students enrolled in public colleges of education. So we've got fewer people studying to in the be, pipeline to become teachers. The pipeline is always like what I worry about the most. Uh, enrollment and graduation from these education colleges has been dropping for several years. Uh, just it, it was down like 2,000 compared to, 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 to 2014. I, I don't want to get too deep into the numbers. Go find Emily's story online at WRL.com. Now, on the vacancy rate, some of it's not an actual vacancy. Some of it is, all right, we couldn't get a fully licensed teacher, so we're going to get a teacher who has a temporary license to, to be in the classroom. That, could be right. a, that person could be a good teacher. We don't know, but we license teachers for a reason. So just the, the, the double whammy of more vacancies and fewer people coming up through the ranks to fill them, that's something we have to think about as a state. Well, that might also help to spur some discussion about retired teachers, because there's been a lot of um, discussion about having retired, allowing retired teachers to come back into the classroom without losing their health benefits. Because right now, you know, they get their pension for what they what their career was, right? Uh, if they choose to come back, they can only work a limited number of hours before they lose their health care benefits. So, you know, there have been talk, I think, in, in, in prior years of trying to change that. And, you know, perhaps given the numbers that we're looking at in this report, perhaps that'll help to spur a little bit more conversation about that. Maybe so, because one other thing I should mention here is a lot of these teachers who are leaving are in their first five years. Uh, that is something like 13 percent mm. of teachers quit in their first five years. Well, that kind of makes sense. But, you know, it, it is interesting that despite all the raises that the legislature has been trying to focus on those years has not been enough. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a big conversation about teacher pay this year. I'm expe- I think you and I are both expecting significant and who, that means different things to different people, raises for teachers and state employees uh, this year. We, we're just seeing vacancy rates that speak to that. So, yeah, we'll see. You know, we don't we'll make the laws, y'all. That's right. And uh, other news, uh, Dave Richard, who is been the longtime head of Medicaid for North Carolina and is retiring at the end of February. Um, so um, he is a, a, a regular presence uh, at, at committee meetings, oversight meetings, uh, you know, a, a very apt and able spokesperson for the program in North Carolina. Um, so congratulations, Dave, for getting to retire. It'll be interesting to see wh- uh, who they line up for replacement. That's a big deal job. That's mm-hmm. that's a managing multi-billion dollars with a lot of federal rules and, you know, trying to be on the cutting edge with different pilot programs, yep. changing, transforming the way Medicaid works. Uh, and he's very knowledgeable and very well thought of. Um, also, we learned this week that um, Ray Starling, as a longtime uh, Republican aide to all sorts of different people's campaigns and offices, uh, is considering a run for AG. Yeah, this was a tweet from Andy Curlis uh, where he was apparently at an event where Ray Starling said this to the crowd. Uh, a- Andy is a former n and reporter who – is he still with the Port Council? I can't remember. He he moved into, uh, into kind of communications work and strategy work uh, several years back, but he put that out on the Twitter sphere. So look for Ray Starling to run, I assume as a Republican, uh, for attorney general because he's been a long time uh, – kind of Republican political aid or operative. Right, I would think. Um, also, um, some some uh, musical chairs happening in the press corps. Uh, Will Doran is joining us here at WRAL. He's coming from the NNO. We are excited as ever to have Will. Um, I've 
worked around him for a long time and is a nice, nice guy and good, good reporter. So we're very happy to have him. Yeah, you'll hear him, I'm sure, at some point on uh, this program that you're listening to right now. Probably so. And then Colin Campbell's moving from NC Tribune to WNC. And I don't know what's going to happen to NC Tribune. He says they're, they want to go ahead and continue to do it with another veteran political journalist. I think they're running out of those at this point. <laughs> or, or just we're all taking different, like we present some, company accepted, right? At some point, we will have all worked for everyone, er, every outlet in uh, yeah. it, that, that makes up the Capitol I press guess, corps. I guess. Uh, so anyway, so that's a job that will be coming open soon. Um, and w- one other little piece of drama this weekend. I don't know how much drama this really is because the Democrats are kind of trying to downplay it. But it looks like there is some conflict over who should be party chair. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Mike Woodard came out and endorsed Anderson Clayton uh, as the new party chair. And Bobby Richardson, former state legislator, is uh, the current party chair and uh, kind of the establishment choice to continue doing that job. So that was interesting. I think it's notable that uh, that Senator Woodard, I think they know each other fairly well. I think they're from, I, I don't know, I don't want to get too far out over my skis. I don't remember what I know about this. Right. But, you know, I think, uh, didn't Governor Cooper endorse Richardson? My understanding is that Cooper, Stein, the, you know, the establishment of the party wants Richardson. I don't know that I've seen that said publicly. Okay. That has been my kind of like understanding from uh, people who do this every day. I think that's about all I've got. Anything else on your list? No, I think that's that, that's what I've got too. Uh, y- y'all, you know, call us, make our phones ring, email us, tell us news. Yep, tell us news. Tell us tell us what your what new bills you're interested in because this is the time of year we get to write about all of them. So. Yeah, and and tell us when we're writing about a bill too much because I think Laura and I both feel like we do that from time <laughs> to time. Rain us in, people. Not always our own idea. But right, <laughs> anyway. right. All right, all right. Well, thanks so much for listening, and we hope you'll join us next week here on the Wrap.